This is pages 198 to 214 of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. Page 198, chapter 229. And when I was asleep, I had one of my favorite dreams. Sometimes I have it during the day, but then it's a daydream. But often I have it at night as well. And the dream, in the dream, nearly everyone on the earth is dead because they have caught a virus. But it's not like a normal virus. It's like a computer virus. And people catch it because of the meaning of something an infected person says and the meaning of what they do with their faces when they say it. Which means that people can also get it from watching an infected person on television. Which means that it spreads around the world really quickly. And when people get the virus, they just sit on the sofa and do nothing, and they don't eat or drink, and so they die. But sometimes I have different versions of the dream, like when you can see two versions of a film, the ordinary one and the director's cut, like Blade Runner. And in some versions of the dream, the virus makes them crash their cars or walk into the sea and drown or jump into rivers. And I think that this version is better because then there aren't bodies of dead people everywhere. And eventually, there is no one left in the world except people who don't look at other people's faces and who don't know what these pictures mean. And these people are all special people like me, and they like being on their own, and I hardly ever see them because they are like a copy in the jungle in the Congo, which are a kind of antelope and very shy and rare. And I can go anywhere in the world, and I know that no one is going to talk to me or touch me or ask me a question. But if I don't want to go anywhere, I don't have to. And I can stay at home and eat broccoli and oranges and licorice laces all the time. Or I can play computer games for a whole week. Or I can just sit in the corner of the room and rub a one-pound coin back and forward over the ripple shapes on the surface of the radiator. And I wouldn't have to go to France. And I go out of Father's house and walk down the street, and it is very quiet, even though it is the middle of the day. And I can't hear any noise except birds singing and wind, and sometimes buildings falling down in the distance. And if I stand very close to traffic lights, I can hear a little clink as the colors change. And I go into other people's houses and play at being a detective. And I can break the windows to get in because the people are dead and it doesn't matter. And I go into shops and take things I want like pink biscuits or PJ's raspberry and mango smoothie or computer games or books or videos. And I take the ladder from father's van and I climb up onto the roof. And when I get to the edge of the roof, I put the ladder across the gap and I climb to the next roof because in a dream you are allowed to do anything. And then I find someone's car keys and I get into their car and I drive and it doesn't matter if I bump into things and I drive to the sea. And I park the car and I get out and there is rain pouring down. And I take an ice cream from a shop and eat it. And then I walk down to the beach. And the beach is covered in sand and big rocks. And there is a lighthouse on a point, but the light is not on because the lighthouse keeper is dead. And I stand in the surf and it comes up and over my shoes. And I don't go swimming in case there are sharks. And I stand and look at the horizon, and I take out my long metal ruler, and I hold it up against the line between the sea and the sky, and I demonstrate that the line is a curve and the earth is round. And the way the surf comes up and over my shoes, and then goes down again, is in a rhythm, like music or drumming. And then I get some dry clothes from the house of a family who are dead, and I go home to father's house, except it's not father's house anymore, it's mine. And I make myself some gobi alu sog with red food coloring in it and some strawberry milkshake for a drink. And then I watch a video about the solar system and I play some computer games and I go to bed. And then the dream is finished and I am happy. Chapter 233 The next morning I had fried tomatoes for breakfast and a tin of green beans which mother heated up in a saucepan. In the middle of breakfast, Mr. Shears said, Okay, he can stay for a few days. And mother said, he can stay as long as he needs to stay. And Mr. Shears said, this flat is hardly big enough for two people, let alone three. And mother said, he can understand what you're saying, you know. And Mr. Shears said, what's he going to do? There's no school for him to go to. We both got jobs. It's bloody ridiculous. And mother said, Roger, that's enough. Then she made me some red zinger herbal tea with sugar in it, but I didn't like it. And she said, you can stay for as long as you want to stay. And after Mr. Shears had gone to work, she made a telephone call to the office and took what is called compassionate leave, which is when someone in your family dies or is ill. Then she said we had to go and buy some clothes for me to wear and some pajamas and a toothbrush and a flannel. 
So we went out of the flat and we walked to the main road, which was Hill Lane, which was the A4088. And it was really crowded and we caught a number 266 bus to Brent Cross Shopping Center. Except there were too many people in John Lewis and I was frightened and I lay down on the floor next to the wristwatches and I screamed and mother had to take me home in a taxi. Then she had to go back to the shopping center to buy me some clothes and some pajamas and a toothbrush and a flannel. So I stayed in the spare room while she was gone because I didn't want to be in the same room as Mr. Shears because I was frightened of him. And when mother got home, she brought me a glass of strawberry milkshake and showed me my new pajamas. And the pattern on them was five pointed blue stars on a purple background like this. And I said, I have to go back to Swindon. And mother said, Christopher, you've only just got here. And I said, I have to go back because I have to sit my maths A-level. And mother said, you're doing maths A-level? And I said, yes. I'm taking it on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday next week. And mother said, God. And I said, the Reverend Peters is going to be the invigilator. And mother said, I mean, that's really good. And I said, I'm going to get an A grade. And that's why I have to go back to Swindon. Except I don't want to see father. So I have to go to Swindon with you. Then mother put her hands over her face and breathed out hard, and she said, I don't know whether that's going to be possible. And I said, but I have to go. And mother said, let's talk about this some other time, okay? And I said, okay, but I have to go to Swindon. And she said, Christopher, please. And I drank some of my milkshake. And later on, at 10.31 p.m., I went out onto the balcony to find out whether I could see any stars. But there weren't any because of all the clouds and what is called light pollution, which is light from streetlights and car headlights and floodlights, and lights in buildings reflecting off tiny particles in the atmosphere and getting in the way of light from the stars. So I went back inside. But I couldn't sleep. And I got out of bed at 2.07 a.m., and I felt scared of Mr. Shears, so I went downstairs and out of the front door into Chapter Road. And there was no one in the street, and it was quieter than it was during the day, and even though you could hear traffic in the distance and sirens, so it made me feel calmer. And I walked down Chapter Road and looked at all the cars and the patterns on the phone wires that they made against the orange clouds, and the things that people had in their front gardens, like a gnome and a cooker and a tiny pond and a teddy bear. Then I heard two people coming along the road, so I crouched down between the end of a skip and a Ford Transit van, and they were talking in a language that wasn't English, but they didn't see me. And there were two tiny brass cogs in the dirty water in the gutter by my feet, like cogs from a wind-up watch. And I liked it between the skip and the Ford Transit van, so I stayed there for a long time. And I looked out at the street, and the only colors you could see were orange and black and mixtures of orange and black. And you couldn't tell what colors the cars would be during the day. And I wondered whether you could tessellate crosses. And I worked out that you could by imagining this picture in my head. And then I heard Mother's voice and she was out shouting, Christopher, Christopher. And she was running down the road. So I came out from between the skip and the Ford Transit van. And she ran up to me and said, Jesus Christ. And she stood in front of me and pointed her finger at my face and said, If you ever do that again, I swear to God, Christopher, I love you, but... I don't know what I'll do. So she made me promise never to leave the flat on my own because it was dangerous and because you couldn't trust people in London because they were strangers. And the next day she had to go to the shops again and she made me promise not to answer the door if anyone rang the bell. And when she came back, she brought some food pellets for Toby and three Star Trek videos. And I watched them in the living room until Mr. Shears came home. And then I went into the spare room again. And I wish that 451C Chapter Road, London, Northwest 25NG had a garden, but it didn't. And the day after that, the office where Mother worked rang and told her she couldn't come back to work because they had got someone else to do her job for her. And she was really angry, and she said that it was illegal, and she was going to complain. But Mr. Shear said, don't be a bloody fool. It was a temporary job, for Christ's sake. And when mother came into the spare room before I went to sleep, I said, I have to go to Swindon to take my A-level. And she said, Christopher, not now. I'm getting phone calls from your father threatening to take me to court. I'm getting it in the neck from Roger. It's not a good time. And I said, but I have to go because it's been arranged and the Reverend Peters is going to invigilate. And she said, look, it's only an exam. I can ring the school. We can get it postponed. You can take it some other time. And I said, I can't take it another time. It's been arranged. And I've done lots of revision. And Mrs. Gascoigne said we could only use a room at school. And Mother said, Christopher, I am just about holding this together.
but I am this close to losing it, all right? So just give me some... Then she stopped talking, and she put her hand over her mouth, and she stood up and went out of the room. And I started feeling a pain in my chest like I did on the underground, because I thought I wasn't going to be able to go back to Swindon and take my A-level. And the next morning, I looked out of the window in the dining room to count the cars in the street to see whether it was going to be a quite good day or a good day or a super good day or a black day. But it wasn't like being on the bus to school because you could look out of the window for as long as you wanted and see as many cars as you wanted. And I looked out the window for three hours and I saw five red cars in a row and four yellow cars in a row, which meant it was both a good day and a black day. So the system didn't work anymore. But if I concentrated on counting the cars, it stopped me from thinking about my A-level and the pain in my chest. And in the afternoon, Mother took me to Hampstead Health in a taxi, and we sat on the top of a hill and looked at the planes coming out at, coming into Heathrow Airport in the distance. And I had a red ice lolly from an ice cream van. And Mother said she had rung Mrs. Gascoigne and told her I was going to take my maths A-level next year. So I threw my red ice lolly away, and I screamed for a long time. And the pain in my chest hurt so much that it was hard to breathe. And a man came up and asked if I was okay. And Mother said, well, what does it look like to you? And he went away. And then I was tired from screaming, and Mother took me back to the flat in another taxi. And the next morning was Saturday, and she told Mr. Shears to go out and get me some books about science and maths from the library. And they were called A Hundred Number Puzzles and The Origins of the Universe and Nuclear Power. But they were for children, and they were not very good, so I didn't read them. And Mr. Shears said, well, it's nice to know my contribution is appreciated. And I hadn't eaten anything since I threw away the red ice lolly on Hampstead Heath, so Mother made me a chart with stars on it like when I was very small, and she filled a measuring jug with Compline and strawberry flavoring, and I got a bronze star for drinking 200 milliliters, and a silver star for drinking 400 milliliters, and a gold star for drinking 600 milliliters. And when Mother and Mr. Shears argued, I took the little radio from the kitchen, and I went and sat in the spare room, and I turned it halfway between two stations, so that all I could hear was white noise. And I turned the volume up really loud, and I held it against my ear. And the sound filled my head, and it hurt so that I couldn't feel any other sort of hurt, like the hurt in my chest. And I couldn't hear Mother and Mr. Shears arguing, and I couldn't think about not doing my A-level or the fact that there wasn't a garden at 451C Chapter Road, London Northwest 25NG, or the fact that I couldn't see the stars. And then it was Monday, and it was very late at night, and Mr. Shears came into my room and woke me up, and he had been drinking beer because he, felt like he smelled like Father did when he had been drinking beer with Rodri. And he said, you think you're so fucking clever, don't you? Don't you ever, ever think about other people for one second, eh? Well, I bet you're really pleased with yourself now, aren't you? And then Mother came in and pulled him out of the room and said, Christopher, I'm sorry. I'm really, really sorry. The next morning, after Mr. Shears had gone to work, Mother packed lots of her clothes into two suitcases and told me to come downstairs and bring Toby and get into the car. And she put the suitcases into the boot and we drove off. But it was Mr. Shears' car, and I said, Are you stealing the car? And she said, I'm just borrowing it. And I said, where are we going? And she said, we're going home. And I said, do you mean home in Swindon? And she said, yes. And I said, is father going to be there? And she said, please, Christopher, don't give me any hassle right now, okay? And I said, I don't want to be with father. And she said, just, just, it's going to be all right, Christopher, okay? It's going to be all right. And I said, are we going back to Swindon so I can do my maths A-level? And mother said, what? And I said, I'm meant to be doing my maths A-level tomorrow. And Mother spoke very slowly and said, We are going back to Swindon because if we stay in London any longer, someone was going to get hurt. And I don't necessarily mean you. And I said, What do you mean? And she said, Now, I need you to be quiet for a while. And I said, How long do you want me to be quiet for? And she said, Jesus. And then she said, Half an hour, Christopher. I need you to be quiet for half an hour. And we drove all the way to Swindon, and it took three hours, 12 minutes, and we had to stop for petrol, and Mother bought me a Milky Bar, but I didn't eat it. And we got caught in a long traffic jam, which was caused by people slowing down to look at an accident on the other carriageway. And I tried to work out a formula to determine whether a traffic jam would be caused just by people slowing down and how this was influenced by A, the density of traffic, and B, the speed of the traffic and see how quickly drivers braked when they saw the break of the lights of the car in front coming on. 
but I was too tired because I hadn't slept the night before because I was thinking about not being able to do my maths A-level, so I fell asleep. And when we got to Swindon, Mother had keys to the house, and we went in, and she said hello, but there was no one there because it was 1.23 p.m. And I was frightened, but Mother said I would be safe, so I went up to my room and closed the door. I took Toby out of my pocket, and I let him run around, and I played Minesweeper, and I did the expert version in 174 seconds, which was 75 seconds longer than my best time. And then it was 6.35 p.m., and I heard Father come home in his van, and I moved the bed up against the door so he couldn't get in, and he came into the house, and he and Mother shouted at each other. And Father shouted, How the fuck did you get in here? And Mother shouted, This is my house too, in case you've forgotten. And father shouted, is your fucking fancy man here as well? And then I picked up the bongo drums that Uncle Terry had bought me and I knelt down in the corner of the room and I pressed my head into the join between the two walls and I banged the drums and I groaned and I carried on doing this for an hour and then father came into the room and said father had gone and she said father had gone to stay with Rodri for a while and we would get a place to live of our own in the next few weeks. Then I went into the garden and I found Toby's cage behind the shed and I brought it inside and I cleaned it and I put Toby back in it. And I asked mother if I could do my maths A-level the next day. And she said, I'm sorry, Christopher. And I said, can I do my maths A-level? And she said, you're not listening to me, are you, Christopher? And I said, I'm listening to you. And mother said, I told you, I rang your headmistress. I told her you were in London. I told her you'd do it next year. And I said, but I'm here now and I can take it. And mother said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I was trying to do things properly. I was trying not to mess things up. And my chest began hurting again, and I folded my arms, and I rocked backward and forward and groaned. And mother said, I didn't know we'd be coming back. But I carried on groaning and rocking backward and forward. And mother said, come on, this isn't going to solve anything. Then she asked if I wanted to watch one of my Blue Planet videos about life under the Arctic ice or the migration of humpback whales. But I didn't say anything because I knew I wasn't going to be able to do my maths A-level, and it was like pressing your thumbnail against a radiator when it's really hot, and the pain starts, and it makes you want to cry, and the pain keeps hurting even when you take your thumb away from the radiator. Then Mother made me some carrots and broccoli and ketchup, but I didn't eat them. And I didn't sleep that night either. The next day, Mother drove me to school in Mr. Shears' car because we missed the bus. And we were getting into the car, Mrs. Shears came across the road and said to Mother, You've got a fucking nerve. And Mother said, Get into the car, Christopher. But I couldn't get into the car because the door was locked. And Mrs. Shears said, So, has he finally dumped you too? Then Mother opened her door and got into the car and unlocked my door, and I got in and we drove away. And when we got to school, Siobhan said, So you're Christopher's mother. And Siobhan said that she was glad to see me again, and she asked if I was okay, and I said I was tired. And Mother explained that I was upset because I couldn't do my maths A-level, so I hadn't been eating properly or sleeping properly. And then Mother went away, and I drew a picture of a bus using perspective, so that I didn't think about the pain in my chest, and it looked like this. And after lunch, Siobhan said that she had spoken to Mrs. Gascoigne, and she still had my A-level papers and three sealed envelopes in her desk. So I asked if I could still do my A-level. And Siobhan said, I think so. We're going to ring the Reverend Peters this afternoon to make sure he can still come in and be your invigilator. And Mrs. Gascoigne is going to write a letter to the examination board to say that you're going to take the exam after all. And hopefully they'll say that that's okay. But we can't know that for sure. Then she stopped talking for a few seconds. I thought I should tell you now so you could think about it. And I said, so I could think about what? And she said... Is this what you want to do, Christopher? And I thought about the question, and I wasn't sure what the answer was because I wanted to do my maths A-level. But I was very tired, and when I tried to think about maths, my brain didn't work properly. And when I tried to remember certain facts, like the logarithmic formula for an approximate number of prime numbers not greater than X, I couldn't remember them, and this made me frightened. And Siobhan said, you don't have to do it, Christopher. If you say you don't want to do it, no one is going to be angry with you. And it won't be wrong or illegal or stupid. It will just be what you want, and that will be fine. And I said, I want to do it, because I don't like it when I put things in my timetable and I have to take them out again, because when I do that, it makes me feel sick. And Siobhan said, okay. And she rang the Reverend Peters, and he came into school at 3.27 p.m. And he said, so, young man, are we ready to roll? 
and I did paper one of my maths A-level sitting in the art room. And the Reverend Peters was the invigilator, and he sat at a desk while I did the exam, and he read a book called The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and ate a sandwich. And in the middle of the exam, he went and smoked a cigarette outside the window, but he watched me through the window in case I cheated. And when I opened the paper and read through it, I couldn't think how to answer any of the questions. And also, I couldn't breathe properly. And I wanted to hit somebody or stab them with my Swiss army knife, but there wasn't anyone to hit or stab with my Swiss army knife except the Reverend Peters, and he was very tall, and if I hit him or stabbed him with my Swiss army knife, he wouldn't be my invigilator for the rest of the exam. So I took deep breaths, like Siobhan said I should do when I want to hit someone in school, and I counted 50 breaths and did cubes of the cardinal numbers as I counted, like this. 1, 8, 27, 64... 125, 216, 343, 512, 729, 1000, 1331, 1728, 2197, 2744, 3375, 4096, 4913, etc. And that made me feel a little calmer. But the exam was two hours long and 20 minutes had already gone, so I had to work really fast and I didn't have time to check my answers properly. And that night, just after I got home, father came back to the house and I screamed, but mother said she wouldn't let anything bad happen to me. And I went into the garden and lay down and looked at the stars in the sky and made myself negligible. And when father came out of the house, he looked at me for a long time, and then he punched the fence and made a hole in it and went away. And I slept a little bit that night because I was doing my math say level, and I had some spinach soup for supper. And the next day, I did paper two, and the Reverend Peters read The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but this time he didn't smoke a cigarette, and Siobhan made me go into the toilets before the exam and sit on my own and do breathing and counting. And I was playing the 11th hour on my computer that evening when a taxi stopped outside the house. Mr. Shears was in the taxi, and he got out of the taxi and threw a big cardboard box of things belonging to Mother onto the lawn. And they were a hairdryer and some knickers and some L'Oreal shampoo and a box of Muesli and two books, Diana, Her True Story by Andrew Morton and Rivals by Jilly Cooper and a photograph of me in a silver frame. And the glass in the photograph frame broke when it fell onto the grass. Then he got some keys out of his pocket and got into his car and drove away. And mother ran out of the house and she ran into the street and shouted, don't fucking bother coming back either. And she threw the box of muesli, and it hit the boot of his car as he drove away. And Mrs. Shears was looking out of her window when Mother did this.